I love it. I love it. All right. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Well, we're told to never judge a book by its cover, aren't we? And Samuel is about to learn that lesson from God this morning. And hopefully we are as well. That God does not see as we see, but God sees the heart. He sees the innards, the, the character, the makeup of a person. You know, we see a, a good-looking melon in the, in the grocery store. And we're like, hey, it looks pretty ripe, looks pretty good. But we don't really know for sure until we cut it open. Sometimes you see a good melon, and you cut it open, and you try it, you're like, that is not a good melon. I'm so disappointed. You're so excited. You got a good watermelon. It's finally in season, and you cut it in, and it's just kind of soggy. You know what I'm talking about. And what good is that? And what God desires when He cuts open the melon of your heart is the sweetness of a faith that trusts in Him and is willing to walk in a courageous obedience according to his word and to his promises. And Samuel and David both are men who when you cut to the core, God is above all else in their hearts. And so we've been studying the book of 1 Samuel and we're coming to chapter 16 where finally young David gets introduced to us. And it's on the heels of one of the roughest chapters in 1 Samuel, I think, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, where God, if you were here last week, you remember that God called Saul to judge the Amalekites. Uh, and Saul did this, but he did so, he carried this out in disobedience. And he kept uh, the best of the cattle and of their produce and of their possessions when God had called him to destroy everything. And so Saul was rejected by God as king, for the second time, we see, um, uh, for, for the second time, uh, Samuel proclaimed to Saul, you've been rejected, and God has somebody else in mind. Saul had a second chance, but he failed again. And now, in chapter 16, we get to meet that someone else whom God has had in mind. And it's none other than young David. So we've got a lot to cover, so we're going to get right to it this morning. If you got your Bibles or your devices, I'd encourage you to open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we'll also have it on the screen here for you as well. Beginning in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So Samuel is grief-stricken here. By all that has taken place, by the events with Saul, he did not take pleasure in rebuking Saul and killing King Agag when Saul failed to kill King Agag. Uh, he does not enjoy this part of his calling from God. But what do we see here? Don't miss it. God sees Samuel in his grief. He sees Samuel in his grief. And God, knowing it's time, he now encourages Samuel to move forward, to move on. God goes on and he says, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send to you Jesse, the Bethlehemite. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So if you remember early on in 1 Samuel, the people demanded a king like all the other nations had. They're like, we want one like everyone else has, a king to fight our battles for us. And so God chose Saul for this. But now Saul has fallen, and, and after receiving a second opportunity, he failed miserably again. So now God is providing a king for himself, a king for himself. So in the people's eyes, Saul is still their king. Saul is still the king. He, he's still ruling and on the throne, and they still listen to him. They, they still follow him. But in God's eyes, Saul is no longer king. He has chosen another, and he's employing Samuel in the task of going and anointing this new king whom God has provided for himself. God is intimately involved in this. This is a key focal point of the entire scriptural narrative. This is an important moment here. This, this is a unique time when God says, I've provided a king for myself among the sons of Jesse. Knowing this means 
King David, for us, we know this, this statement has far-reaching prophetic implications here, doesn't it? That there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. God is establishing here now the messianic line. This is huge. Samuel doesn't know the implications of this. He doesn't. He's trusting God, and he's recording for us here what all transpired. But God, who chose Israel, is now narrowing it down again and choosing a son of Jesse. God is providing a king and a kingly line of his choosing. Verse 2, moving on. And Samuel said to God, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. So this is how tyrannical Saul has become in his kingship. Where before, if you remember, he was hiding. He did not want to answer the call of God to become king. And he wanted to avoid it in any way possible. But now, Samuel knows he will kill Samuel to keep his kingship. He has fully succumbed to the corrupting force of unchecked power. Being told twice now that God has rejected him and chosen another, but he still refuses to listen. And now Samuel fears for his life. But, but look at this relationship, again, that Samuel has with God. We, we've talked about it before in 1 Samuel, but, but see how Samuel tells God his concerns. We so often you know, think, God already knows you know, what I'm thinking. God knows what I'm going through. Yeah, but in a relationship, you, you tell each other what's going on. Samuel continues telling God what's going on. Saul's going to kill me if I go. And Samuel knows that God loves him and, and God cares for him. And Samuel loves God, so he, he feels free to speak frankly with God. How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So the Lord hears Samuel's concern and he gives a solution. And I think it's a little funny because God's being a little bit sneaky here. He's being a little sneaky, telling Samuel, okay, take a heifer, that's what you're going to do, and then say, man, I'm coming to make a sacrifice to the Lord, and then be sure that you just so happen to invite Jesse to this event, and be sure his sons are there. So, so God, he's not telling Samuel to lie, right? He, he's just being sneaky. God is, God is keeping this one close to the chest here. Uh, verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. And, and remember, before we move on, uh, Samuel is the prophet, right, who, who just hacked King Agag to pieces uh, in the last chapter. He's a prophet who, you know, called down thunder and rain in the, in the dry season. And the people are like, who is this guy? He calls out to God for thunder and rain, and God listens to him in the dry season. And, and, and then he just hacked King Agag to pieces. Um, he's, I mean, <laughs> he comes to Bethlehem, the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? <laughs> you come in peace. And so, I mean, this is just, you just see, you hear what they're thinking behind that. Um, uh, verse 5, and Samuel said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Right, Samuel is thinking here about Saul. Man, Saul, tall, dark, and handsome. Saul, Saul wins the People's Choice Award every time. And, and even in Samuel's mind, man, he's thinking along these lines. This is the guy, right? The biggest and the best should be the king because, man, we got enemies on every side. We need a big guy, strong guy to lead us. But God says, you can't tell a king. You can't tell a king from outward appearance. He says, I look at the heart. That is where the true ranking of kings lies. It is in the heart. Eliab looks the part. He looks the part, but his heart is lacking. 
He has been rejected as Saul has been rejected. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has, cho- has, has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And this statement, this response from Samuel, just it really stood out to me this week in a powerful way. And this, this is our first big takeaway uh, from this passage this morning. Um, this, to me, demonstrates the faith of Samuel. God told him it would be a son of Jesse. It was not any of the son of Jesse's that Samuel saw with his eyes. It's going to be son of Jesse, but it's none of the sons of Jesse that you see. But Samuel is not troubled. He, do, he doesn't doubt God because he cannot see the truth of God's word before him. He doesn't throw his hands up and say, well, God's wrong. Uh, I guess I can't trust God anymore now. What does he do? He instead says, he says in his heart, well, it must be because God said it was so. So it must be that there is another son of Jesse that I cannot see. Do you see that progression? God said it was so, but I can't see it. But God said it was so, so I believe it. Is there something perhaps like that in your life this morning? Is this not a challenge of our faith? God said it, but I can't see it. And how does our faith respond to that? What does the author of Hebrews say about this? In chapter 11, Verses 1 to 3, he says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. Guys like Samuel. Man, this is the list. Hebrews chapter 11 lists the hall of fame of, of guys of faith. And Samuel is mentioned by name in the New Testament in Hebrews 11 for his faith. That we see it right here, his faith. And, and, and in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 um, it goes on, it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It was made so by the word of God, just as the word of God declares to Samuel, the next king is a son of Jesse, but the sons of Jesse have passed before Samuel, and God chose None of this. None of, none of those sons. What does faith say? Well, faith says what, what Samuel says. Are all your sons here? There's got to be more. The assumption of Samuel is that God's word is accurate. And what is inaccurate is the information available to understand it. So we keep asking questions in pursuit of the truth. And the cool thing about this is that this holds true. This holds true. Especially in fields like archaeology. Now, waiting for more information has always shown the Bible more accurate than any skeptic would dare give it credit for. And if you'll in, indulge my tangent for a few minutes here, uh, I'm going to give you a few examples of how this has worked out. Uh, the Hittite civilization um, talked about in the Old Testament. It's talked about like 40 times in the Old Testament. They talk about them a lot. Uh, and there, there was no archaeological evidence for the Hittites, so... The skeptics would say things like, well, the Bible is this, it's this mythical creation you know, by these Hebrew writers you know, about this mythical Hittite people. There's no evidence for them. That's evidence that they just kind of made it all up. Uh, but then in 1906, a German archaeologist named Hugo uh, Winkler, he was ex- excavating in Turkey and discovered the capital city of the ancient Hittite empire. The entire Hittite library and 10,000 clay tablets documenting the Hittite history were found there. And so here's an image of one of those clay tablets. And scholars translated these writings and discovered that in fact, contrary to being mythology, everything the Bible said about the Hittites was accurate. Another one. There's a lot of King David critics out there uh, who believe King David was a legendary mythical character, 
you know, the same kind of thinking. Um, and they would point back again to a lack of archaeological evidence for King David being an actual historical figure. Uh, but then in 1994, archaeologists discovered an ancient stone slab near uh, northern Galilee, and it was inscribed with a reference to King David, and they kind of highlighted it in white there. That's the stone that references King David and the House of David. And then another example is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, were crucial, and they proved false, this, this theory, that because Scripture had been copied and recopied and recopied again and again and again and again throughout the centuries, man, somebody is going gonna, is gonna to change it. It's going to get messed up. Somebody's going to insert maybe their own, you know, narrative of the times and, and kind of make it fit where they want it to fit. You know, but then you f- they found these Dead Sea Scrolls, which, which were written 200 years, um, at least, before the time of Christ, and, and 1,000 years uh, before many of the ancient manuscripts we have of, of the Scriptures. And yet, they, they took these Dead Sea Scrolls and the, and the oldest manuscripts they had, which were still like you know, hundreds or thousands, a thousand years, you know, later than this, and they compared them, and there was no variance. There's no variance. There's, there's a few minor differences here of, of, of how, how things were worded or written, but they had no, they had, there was absolutely no variance in the, in the core of the text. This, this is nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but it's a miracle of God. Matthew uh, 5.18, Jesus says, Uh, Jesus, the word made flesh. He says this. He says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. God is preserving his word until all is accomplished. Yes, the cross and the resurrection, but then also the second coming and the end of the age. Last example. Uh, Critics used to believe that the book of Acts was historically... uh, inaccurate. And a man named Sir William Ramsey, uh, who, who's one of the greatest um, historical scholars and archaeologists in history, um, he decided to try to disprove the Bible was the inspired word of God uh, by showing that the book of Acts was not historically accurate. And at the time, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, many of the cities mentioned in the book of Acts uh, were unknown. People just didn't know where these locations were. It's like, okay, here's this city, this city, this city. It's like, okay, we don't really know where these are. So he's like, I'm going to go and show that this is just made up. This is just a made up story. And so he went there, and after spending 30 years doing archaeological research in the Middle East, Ramsey came to the, to the conclusion that, uh, and, and I quote uh, from his book published in, in 1915, The Bearing of Recent Discovery. He writes on page 85, he says, further study showed that the book could bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority for the facts of the Aegean world, and that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and perception of truth as to be a model of historical statement. And on page 89 of that same book, Ramsey accounted, um, he says, you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians. And Luke is the author of the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, nine Mediterranean islands, and 95 people, and he didn't get one of them wrong. Contrary to this, the first year the Encyclopedia Britannica was published, it contained so many mistakes regarding the places in the United States that it had to be recalled. So scripture has not been shown false by archaeology. In fact, it has been proven true over and over and over again. Even in the smallest of details, modern modern archaeology is showing us the historical accuracy of the scriptures and how incredible it is. As we've waited for more information to come out, it has proven the scriptures more and more true. So those those are just a few examples. We can go on and on. Uh, But the point is that if you're willing... As Sir Ramsey was willing to put to test the writings of the scriptures with an open mind to the truth, you may find yourself, along with Ramsey, believing before the journey's end. Jesus takes his disciples on an amazing and often scary journey, teaching them all the while, sometimes reproofing them, as he did with Peter, James, and John, and Thomas, and all the rest. He'd reproof them from time to time, correct them, challenge them, encourage them, 
comfort them. He took, this on the, uh, uh, took them on a journey to grow them, to show them who he truly is. And in Mark chapter 4, remember the storm when, when Jesus was asleep in the stern on a cushion, and there was this massive squall that came, and the, and the waves were crashing over the boat. It was filling with water, and the disciples went to Jesus. They're like, teacher, don't you care if we drown? You know, shaking him awake. I don't know how he was sleeping. And he got up, and he rebuked the wind and the waves. He says, be quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this guy? (laughs) Even the wind and the waves obey him. The entire time of their trial, Jesus was with them in the boat. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so frantic? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? You're in a trial, but God is going to strengthen you through it, for he is with you. God is calling us to trust in him, to trust in his word, to trust him. No matter our circumstances, we trust him. We don't need all the answers all at once. We're called to trust in God. God gave Samuel the information he needed, and Samuel trusted in God to reveal the rest in time. It's a son of Jesse. It's not one of the sons that you can see. Well, okay, Jesse, in that case, do you have another son? Verse 11, and he, Jesse, said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. For we will not sit down till he comes. So Samuel is a bit perturbed here, it seems. We're not sitting down until he comes. And the question he is implying with this, you know, why, with this, with this demand, you know, go get him, we're not going to sit down. He's implying, he's like, why, why was this son left out when I invited you and all your sons? Why was he left out? Send and get him. We're all going to stand here and wait for you. Okay, we're not moving until you go get the son that you left out. And it's interesting to ponder, you know, why is David out tending the sheep? The prophet is in town. See, I mean, this is a rarity. He's coming, he's doing a sacrifice, and he specifically, he personally invited Jesse. He said, Jesse, bring your sons. And yet the youngest son is out keeping the sheep. It's hard to say for sure. But it would seem that David is just kind of left out a lot and given the job to tend the sheep. But even though he was left out, even though he was an outcast in his own family, God saw him. God saw David. God loved David. And he didn't leave David out. He doesn't leave David out. He brings in the outcast. This is Samuel's unsaid rebuke. You didn't bring in all your sons. You left one out. We're not going to sit down until you bring them in. Samuel is a man of God. He perceives what is happening here, that all the boys, including their father, knew. They all knew that David was left out. God calls him in. God doesn't see like we do. He doesn't see like we do. He doesn't play the insider game. He came for the sick. He came for the lost. The angels came announcing the birth of Christ to the shepherds, tending their flocks in the fields, and he did not announce it to King Herod. He sees the outcast. He loves the outcast. Verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Wait a second. Didn't, didn't God just tell Samuel he doesn't look at the outward appearance? Okay, why is this lady killer just walking in the room right now? It's all about his outward appearance. Okay, it's a little funny. It is. His dreamy eyes, handsome face comes in. But interestingly, we read that he was ruddy. He was ruddy, which means he was red. The word means red. And it's the same word that's used for Esau. Oh, you showed the picture. Yeah, there you go. Okay, the same word used for Esau. Okay, the twin brother of Jacob. Wait, who is that? That's an ancestor of David. 
Uh, and when Esau, if you remember, when Esau came out of the womb, it says he was, he was red and hairy all over. Esau was a redhead. And it seems perhaps David was too. Okay, and, and the, the ESV says ruddy. The NASB says he was reddish. And this perhaps could mean his complexion uh, or, or a sign of health. Uh, we don't often, you know, think of Jewish people being redheads. Uh, but there are redheads uh, throughout uh, the Jewish ancestry. Uh, Judas Iscariot was actually said to be a redhead, and which actually caused a lot of persecution to redheaded Jews in Europe. Uh, so I'm probably messing with all of your images of King David right now, uh, because I always picture David, you know, dark eyes, dark hair, olive skin, you know, and is it, he's redheaded? What? what? It, a, it's, it really sounds like he is, man. Sorry, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being a red, I mean, but he kind of was, he kind of was treated like a redheaded stepchild, wasn't he? I mean, it's like, send, send the ginger out to tend the sheep, man. It's messed up, it's messed up. But man, he's, but David, think of David, man, he's this fiery poet, musician, warrior, fiery redhead, maybe. Man, that's crazy. Okay, enough about his redness. Uh, we also read he had beautiful eyes. And, and this in scripture, for sure, probably has a dual meaning here. Uh, and, and it probably even more pertains to his soul. For we know the eyes are the window to the soul. So, so Jesus and Proverbs, they have a lot to say about eyes. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 22 through 23, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So how do you see? How do you look? How do you perceive? Is it through a lens of darkness? Or is it through a lens of light and truth and love? This, Jesus declares, makes a world of difference. Proverbs says of this in Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. It's a good verse for your kids. <laughs> a look in the eye, a scornful look, a mocking look, a haughty look can tell you a lot about what's going on in the heart. Tell you a lot about a soul of a man or a woman. Beautiful eyes are humble eyes. Beautiful eyes are merciful eyes, are compassionate eyes, slow to anger, abounding in love. Beautiful eyes are courageous they're bold. Beautiful eyes declare an openness to warmth and light and life. Beautiful eyes, they, they see, they perceive, they're open to the things of God. Jesus in Matthew 13 says uh, this when he is asked, you know, why do you teach in parables, Jesus? Why, why are you doing this? And he says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and long to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So the beautiful eyes of David longed to see the promises of God fulfilled, the prophecies of the Messiah to come to fruition, many of which were given through David himself in the Psalms, who David is a prophet. And he wrote many messianic prophecies throughout the Psalms. 
And, and beyond that, David's life is a type and a shadow of the true king who is to come. The true king whom David wrote of. And so the life of David is one that points to Jesus, the humble king, the rejected king, the king who was faithful to God throughout his life. David had eyes that perceived. They saw the world and all that was in it, and they saw that it was God's. And his eyes saw, they perceived, the great love of God and the great faithfulness of God. And so David, was, he was bold in his life. He was full of faith, and he saw the unseen realities of this life. He writes in Psalm 24, he says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. David writes again in Psalm 25, he says, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. And of course, Psalm 23, the shepherd boy who was out tending the flock when Samuel came, searching for him. David writes Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And because of that, I shall not want, I shall not fear, for he is with me. He is with me. David's eyes, his beautiful eyes, perceived the reality, the reality that many who live in fear cannot perceive. Right? Those who live in fear that while seeing, they do not perceive that God is with them. And our Lord asked them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They saw, but they did not perceive who was in the boat with him. So may we be those who, who not only see, but also perceive the spiritual reality that surrounds us, that we walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. Moving on here, uh, verse 12 and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Psalm 23 again, David writes, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The outcast brother who's out tending the sheep is anointed in the midst of his brothers who left him out. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. His job, Samuel's job, now being done, Samuel leaves, and he trusts in God with the rest. And we will see that God has a plan, and he, and he orchestrates this uh, wonderfully. And so we're going to see this real quick. We're going to finish up uh, this chapter. I promise it, we'll, we'll get through the end pretty quick here. Verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The Spirit of the Lord left Saul. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. I'm really getting a good picture of David here. His, his reputation precedes him as a man who is skillful, who is of good presence, of valor, and war, prudent in speech. The Spirit of the Lord is upon David, and God is at work orchestrating this encounter with the servant of Saul. And so because of this tormenting spirit from God, it moves Saul into action to bringing David into the royal court. Verse 19, therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David uh, his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Remember Jonathan's armor bearer from uh, chapter 14? This is a great honor to be an armor bearer of a general, to be an armor bearer of a king. Uh, you must be one of the bravest and the most promising of warriors to be chosen for this task. Verse 22, and Saul sent to Jesse, 
saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So through the worship music of David, the harmful spirit departed from Saul. David, a man filled with the Spirit of God, had spiritual power while playing the lyre for Saul. So notice that when God calls, he equips. When God calls, he equips. God had Samuel anoint David king, and we might have expected Samuel to then take David under his wing and then train him up in the ways, but no, he leaves because he knows God has a plan, and God has now orchestrated David to now be in the court of King Saul to learn as his armor bearer and private musician how King Saul is leading and being a king. So, so this shepherd boy is now learning uh, what it's like to lead a nation. But because of Saul's shortcomings, we know this can't last very long, lest David himself be corrupted by Saul. And so again, God orchestrates it where, where jealousy comes up in the heart of Saul, uh, and yet David has this close relationship with Jonathan, um, but then Saul eventually drives David away, um, thus sparing David from Saul's corrupting presence, um, and yet David had the experience of being uh, mentored and being his armor bearer for a while. So if we've been called by God for any amount of time in our life, now we can look back on our journeys of where God's taken us until now, and we, look, we can look back on that time with compassion, knowing and seeing how God was at work in our lives, equipping us, uh, drawing us to himself. And we're, we're in those times where he taught us to say, I can't, God, I can't, but you can. You can. Please do, please show up. And we look back, we see God's guiding hand in our lives through the entire process. And we see here how he loves David. He loves David, yes. That listen, God loves you in this same way as well. Truly he does. He is orchestrating his calling on your life. He's preparing you. He is shaping you into a man and woman after his own heart, after the likeness of his son. So as we wrap up, let us remember who this story is about. It's not about Samuel. It's not about young David. It's not about Jesse. The story is about God. The God who is shaping the line of redemption by his sovereign choosing. He is establishing a kingly line for the Messiah who is to come. For our hope is not in David. Our hope is in the one whom David hoped in. The very son of God. Our hope is in our Lord Jesus Christ the one who is with us in all things, the one who comforts us in all things, the one who intercedes on our behalf in the heavenly courts, the name that's above every name, the one who came and who's promised to come again. And though we cannot see him, we trust in him. And though we do not know the day nor the hour when he will return, we wait expectantly with our lamps lit and our oils full, being about the Lord's business which is disciple-making. Jesus made disciples, and he has commissioned us to join him in that, to do the same, to go from here to the ends of the earth. He commissioned his disciples to do that. And that's what we're talking about in February here uh, as, we, as we look at missions. And next week, uh, next Sunday, it kicks off our missions week where, man, where we recommit, we re-up our commitment to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth, uh, locally, and abroad, descending funds. And so, man, I hope even now God might be stirring in your heart what that, what that might look like for us to invest in the ends of the earth as we, as we fill out our faith promise cards. And we'll be talking more about what those are uh, next week. But it's a wonderful thing for us to be able to partner with missionaries across the world. And we know that it begins right here with us. For all of us, no one is exempt from the calling of God to missions. We're all called to be disciple makers. And if you have a, have a bulletin, um, I'd encourage you, turn to the back of your bulletin. This is, on, this is on the bulletin. It's been on the bulletin every week for, I don't know, months and months and months. And maybe because it's here, we often miss it. Maybe we don't look at it. But this is the oikos principle. And oikos, we know, uh, is, is that Greek word that means household. And it's the people who are in your, in your, your life, your extended family, 
I mean, there's people that God's put in your life so you can speak into their lives and you can share with them all the things that God has done in your life. And so these are people you work with. These are people in your family. And these are, these are, these are relatives you see. These are friends who, who you're connected with. These are the people you see when you, when you go into the market, when you go to shopping. Man, man, these are people God's supernaturally put in your life for you to be investing in, praying for, thinking about. And this is not to, to add another thing to your big list of to-dos. This is simply to open our eyes, to open our eyes to what God might be leading us to, what he might be preparing us for, what conversation we might have. Maybe it's just inviting somebody into your life and the things that you're already doing. <laughs> you don't have to add something to your list. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going golfing. Let me invite somebody new. We're making dinner anyway. Let's invite somebody to join us. It doesn't have to be as hard as we make it. <laughs> it's inviting people into the things that you're already doing in life and, and being intentional about praying for them, thinking about them, and being willing to share and how good God is, how, how much God has done in your own life, and how it's changed everything. How it's changed everything. How it's given us hope that when we've lost loved ones, we don't grieve as others do. Because we trust in God that there will one day be a great reunion with those who have gone before us. The great cloud of witnesses who has gone before us. That great hope of reunion that we have. So we are people of hope and of joy. And God is calling us to bring others into the fold. To bring them into the fold. They will know us by our love. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you that you've called us to join you in your mission. To reach the nations. Thank you, Father, for that high calling. That how, how, how sweet are the feet that bring good news. God, you've given us good news. Give us hearts that are willing to share it. And Lord, we pray for those people in our life, those people that you've connected to KCC, the thousands and thousands of people that are represented here by the connections of the people here with them. God, we pray for them. May they know you. May they grow in faith. May they encounter you in a real life-changing way. For Lord, life with you, though you take us on a journey, though the storms may come, you're with us. You're growing us. You're stretching us. So God, remind us of that this morning. We cannot see it right now, but you are at work. And you are faithful. So Lord, throughout the storms, may we know, may we be reminded that you are with us, Lord. So God, and you know each heart in here. You know what, what each of us walked in this room with. And Lord, I just pray that you would renew the hearts here. That those who came heavy laden and burdened, would, would lay them down at your feet and take your yoke upon their shoulders that's easy and as light, Lord. Would you give them a new skip in their step? God, would you rejuvenate spirits to overflowing? God, each of us at different times need encouragement, Lord. Encourage the hearts here that need encouragement. Renew their joy. Remind them of your love for them. God, we thank you. We thank you that you're with us, that you see us in our grief and you comfort us and you encourage us. And when it's time, you say, it's time to move forward. So God, help us to move forward in you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song.